Now, our beautiful artists are in a position to send a message to our people, a message of deliverance, a message of prosperity, a message of rise up, you mighty people. Then why? Open up your legs and show us in a negative light. I hurt nobody. You sound good. You rap good. So do what you got to do to get paid. Thank and don't you. listen to all the negative kids. Hey. 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 I'm stuff. a mother of four, Kim, and they listen to your music. My daughters go to Catholic school, and I'm going to tell you something. They may sing it, dance to it, but all of them are straight-A students. So you know what? Madonna did it. You can do it. Keep up the And I was an A student, too. Thank you, girl. In this episode of Let's Talk About Sex History, we're going to discuss black female expression in music and black sexual politics. It's about to get scholarly and freaky in here. Plus, there are more freaky Kims in the 90s than you may remember. You know who supports scholarly pursuits and freaky behavior? Beducated. They've sponsored so many videos on my channel that explore sexuality, especially from black women's points of view. Burlesque and hygiene history, I'm looking at you. We're always talking about sex history, but what about just sex? If you're looking for a new kind of sexual education, Beducated offers over 100 inclusive and accessible courses that can take you deep into explorations of sex and your body. If you want more powerful orgasms, I'm talking bucket and a mop orgasms with or without a partner. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet ass P word. Beducated can help with explicit yet educational videos and guides. The site is packed with reliable information created by certified experts. And you can try all of those courses for one day free using the link in my description box. How free is free? You won't get charged within the first 24 hours and you can cancel anytime. But once you decide to stick around, you can level up your love life for just $10 a month. There's even a 14 day money back guarantee. And because Beducated loves intellectual media, my subbies can get 40% off the yearly pass with my code Elexis. Pop down to my description box for the link and don't forget to tell Beducated Elexis sent you. Now, let's get into the history. over dirty limericks in world history, the eroticism in pre-modern poetry, and white European obsession with blurring the line between scatological humor and erotica, and go directly to dirty jazz and blues musicians of the early 20th century. Bessie Smith was one of the most widely known singers of the 1920s and 30s in race records directed towards black Americans, but bought by white people too. Her lyrics were mainly about being independent, courageous, and sexy. And Bessie, who was bisexual, had a reputation for being a low or coarse woman, which you might call ghetto or ratchet today. In her popular yet eyebrow-raising 1928 song, Empty Bed Blues, she crooned, he's a deep sea diver with a stroke that can't go wrong. He can stay at the bottom and his wind holds out so long. He boiled my first cabbage and he made it awful hot. Then he put in the bacon and overflowed the pot. These innuendo-laden lyrics packed a potent punch in the 1920s when the black middle class was especially beholden to religiosity and respectability politics in the face of racial violence. According to Angela Davis, the scholar Daphne Duval Harrison found that black female blues singers rarely sang about children, domestic life, husbands, and marriage, instead discussing sex, erotica, homosexuality, mistreatment, promiscuity, infidelity, and more. Their realities as black women conflicted with what the black elite wanted it to be. There were women like Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, Nanny Helen Burroughs, and others who embodied the ideal form of black womanhood that many believe would lead to better race relations, and the women and men who sang the blues represented the lower class. So all jazz and blues would come to be seen as deviant, or even of the devil himself. But the blues, and by extension dirty lyrics, always had an audience. Ma Rainey also recorded songs in the 20s that showcased sensual desires, but a cover of her 1924 song Shave Em Dry by Lucille Bogan, aka Bessie Jackson, in 1935 was tweaked and made notorious. She sang, I got nipples on 
on my titties, big as the end of my thumb. I got something between my legs will make a dead man come. Why can I picture Sexy Red saying that? And we can't forget, now if fucking was the thing that would take me to heaven, I'd be fucking in the studio till the clock strike 11. Oh daddy, daddy, shave him dry. I would fuck you baby, honey, I'd make you cry. Black women weren't alone in singing their sexual desires and frustrations. There are countless examples of dirty songs by white and black men. And like black women, white women sang body tunes in burlesque and vaudeville. In addition to the recording of songs with sly innuendos, many were performed live and never recorded. Plus, lots of performers improvised lyrics when on the chitlin circuit, so we'll never truly know how dirty the jazz and blues singers got. And you'd think that would mean assuring they would stay generally in the realm of adult listeners until you consider that age slash consent was a lot more fluid during this period. Teens still hadn't hardened as a concept, and plenty of them ended up at juke joints and rent parties where dirty jazz and blues songs could be heard live or on jukeboxes or record players, but not on the radio. Jazz, blues, and so-called race records eventually became R&B, and similar topics of love, sex, betrayal, and black womanhood continued to be central. In the wider music world, Serge Gainsbourg and Jane Birkin recorded a song in 1969 where they were quite literally having sex on the track, allegedly. Similarly, Donna Summer invoked passion on 1975's Love to Love You Baby, in which she moaned on the track. The song reached number two on the US charts. Then there was Minnie Ripperton, whose 1975 track Inside My Love didn't always get played on the radio because she sang, will you come inside me? You can come inside me. Who doesn't love a cream pie? On the 1982 track I'm the One, Roberta Flack sang, when it comes to making love, I am the best, I'm all yours, put me to the test. Which sounds sweet until you remember she approached a guy about being his lover for a hot night, not marriage or a relationship. For this to be a mainstream song, it's clear that sexual politics were changing. I skipped the 1985 parental advisory fiasco because you can catch the entire saga here in episode 4 of Lectual Does the 80s, but the Mary Jane Girls' is My House was included and the lyrics were super tame by today's standards. After the more overt yet still subtle sexual references in R&B of the 70s and 80s, black women in the newest genre, hip hop, were even more direct. Salt and Pepper were definitely sexy when they arrived on the scene in the late 80s, but then came their 1990 song Let's Talk About Sex, which in inspired this series name. The song wasn't explicit, but it was straightforward and highlighted the positive and negative aspects of sex during a time when HIV AIDS awareness was crucial, especially for black women. In 1993's None of Your Business, they rapped, if I wanna take a guy home with me tonight, it's none of your business. If she wanna be a freak and sell it on a weekend, it's none of your business. While this anti-slut shaming anthem directly conflicted with black respectability politics, it was still very tame compared to the new girlies on the block. In 1990, N.W.A.'s Easy e signed the short-lived Hoes with Attitude, whose 1991 debut album Living in a Ho House made one reviewer write, this LA-based trio makes the mistake of fighting fire with fire, appealing to the animal instincts of the male species by talking dirty to them. The group was made up of Kim, aka Baby Girl, her sister, and her cousin. In one song, Nasty, the trio rapped, he ain't getting no pussy cause his dick is too short, yeah I said you were ready to play, this ain't Burger King, you can't have it your way. In 1990, before there was Lil' Kim, there was another Kim named Kim Davis, AKA Choice from Houston, Texas, who was associated with the Ghetto Boys. She rapped on Cat Got Your Tongue in 1990. He really tried to eat my meat. He must have been a new freak cause he was nothing but teeth. I said, hold up, goddamn, what the fuck? Nigga, get your black ass up. Can you tell I'm having fun reading these? Wrote the New York Times, Choice is nearly a mirror image of the rapper she answers. She too subscribes to the categorization of women as bitches hoes and freaks, although she bristles when men try to buy her favors. But unlike most of her male counterparts, she sounds like she actually enjoys sex, even while she's keeping score. HWA and Choice were joined by Bitches With Problems, or BWP, in 1990, with Bitches standing for beautiful, young, talented college honeys. Starring Linda McCaskill and Tanisha Michelle, their song Two Minute Brother reached number six on the rap charts. See, I'm the kind of bitch that loves to be fucked, trimmed, tucked, stuffed, and sucked up in my ass deep down in 
my throat so we can get busy, but Jimmy, wear a raincoat. Their raunchy music and the accompanying video even reached the mainstream, with Entertainment Weekly reporting in 1991 that, quote, a whole ivory soap factory couldn't wash these ladies' mouths clean. Just like all the other black and sexual female artists who came before them, BWP were dynamic women with wide interests. Talking about, like, the ghetto boys' music and <laughs> bitches with problems' music, like pornography. Well, let's check out the movie system. Let's check out the, the evening news and, and daytime soap operas. This is all pornography. This is all explicit. Now, as far as, as we come up and we make music, and it's entertainment, first of all, and we do speak on a lot of reality-based subjects, it's all true, and what goes on about, we hold up that memo in society, and we display what we see and what we know, and that's what we talk about. And what we have created is a communications medium that can reach from one small town to one large city to a suburb to reach all minds. And you have these conservative black folks who just out to destroy it. Oh, we won't play their records. Oh, our children's music, get that out of here. Especially it's, black it's radio, they, they sit up and, there and they say, we won't play rap music on this yeah, radio. And, you know, the two even licensed the Rodney King video for their music video, Wanted, which stemmed from a 1985 incident in which Linda was beaten and choked by police. Still, there was a potent fear and mistrust of black women who made explicit rap that could go bar for bar with that of the men. The fear of the black woman's sexuality can be summed up by an Ice Cube quote. The power of sex is more powerful than the motherfuckers in Saudi Arabia. A girl that you want to get with can make you do damn near anything if she knows how to do her shit right. The theme of a powerful and sexy woman or a seductive femme fatale and the future of pussy rap can't be examined without this quote, but we'll be back to that in a moment. Clearly, for BWP to reach number six on the rap charts, there was a budding consumer base looking for raw lyrics by black women, and these would be the ones who found empowerment in the lyrics. But on the flip side, criticism of explicit women was the norm. Said Queen Latifah, I like some of what BWP does. BWP are just saying stand up for yourself and don't be bullied by any man. I just have some problems on the vulgar way they say certain things. No Noted executive Liar Cohen, who claimed that one lyric from their debut album had been eliminated for being beyond the breaking point, also said that Bitches was one of the truest recorded histories of urban teenage girls ever made. There are a lot more BWPs than Queen Latifahs. The album didn't bear the logo of Russell Simmons' Rush Associated Labels, a subsidiary of Def Jam, where Cohen was the president, because of rumors that they didn't want to be associated with its explicit content. When asked about rumors that some women at Columbia refused to work on the album, Simmons said, there are black women at every label who wouldn't think that group is funny. The explicitness of lyrics by HWA and BWP, while radical when juxtaposed to expectations of black women's behavior, don't obscure the larger conversation happening in the early 90s about hip hop. This is a major topic in the upcoming Lectual Does the 90 series, but for now, I'll note that C. Dolores Tucker was leading the charge against misogyny in hip hop and being dragged for it. But the misogyny was always a step away from female rappers, even when they were being lauded for sticking it to men. In addition to BWP being under the rapist Russell Simmons, at the January 27th, 1991 release party for BWP, future hip hop mogul Dr. Dre assaulted journalist D. Barnes. She got beat down. The person, the host of that show did something and she know what she did and got beat down and I hope it happened again. See you around, buddy boy. After getting a slap on the wrist and being ordered to pay Barnes money, he would say the next year, ain't nothing you can do now by talking about it. Besides, it ain't no big thing. I just threw her through a door. His career, of course, was intact, and he'd go on to beat other women. In 1993, the rapper LaShawn rapped on Wild Thing. I know you're hungry. Come on, continue. I'm gonna fill you up. Just look at the menu. He gave me some tongue. The man was delicious. On a health scale, he was very nutritious. If you don't recognize these lyrics, you definitely recognize the opening lyrics and the beat of the song, which would be used in LL Cool J's hit song, Doing It. Though she laid down all the iconic filthy lines of one of my favorite songs of all time, LaShawn wasn't featured in the video because she was pregnant, which likely impacted her career. The same year of Doing It, Adina Howard sang about being a freak like me, which was certified platinum, fitting for an era known for freak Nick. What is being a freak anyways? Is it face sitting? Is it anal sex? Is it group sex? Is it fisting? What about pegging? Would you be shocked if I told you there's an explicit lyric for every one of those? If you wanna go outside of your usual freak level, that's where Beducated comes in. You can't get your sexual questions answered by music. Get them answered by certified experts. Level up your love life for just $10 a month. 
Don't forget to use my code ELEXIS for 40% off the yearly pass. So if you want to be a freak until the day, until the dawn, pop down to my description box for the link. And make sure you tell them that your girl, Alexis, sent you. The naughty 90s, when it comes to black women, belong to Kimberly Denise Jones and to a lesser extent, Foxy Brown. Harlots are heroines, asked the source in 1997. Inga Marchand was 17 years old when she recorded the following line on LL Cool J's I Shotcha in 1995. Four carrots, the ice rocks, pussy banging like Versace locks, pops, so what the deal? Wanna creep? Open like raw ass cheeks. I'm sex and raw dog without protection, disease infested, ugh. Lil' Kim's 1996 debut album Hardcore was iconic and controversial. Kim was in an abusive relationship with Christopher Wallace, aka Biggie, and whether or not he wrote the lyrics for her was a major rumor that hounded the early part of her career. But her lyrics of grit and frankness on later albums have stood the test of time and inspired countless female MCs down the line. She bragged on Queen Bitch, bet I wet you like hurricanes and typhoons, got buffoons eating my pussy while I watch cartoons. And a series of articles picked apart her image and whether or not her music, which was massively popular among different classes of women, was empowering or exploitative. In 1997, the Rolanda Watts show asked, is Lil' Kim sexualizing our children, turning Kim into a villain responsible for the morality of American youth? Now they're little kids. This little girl's 12 years old and keeps singing the lyrics. Hi, Chanel. <laughs> Hi, Chanel. Chanel's a big fan of little. Come here, talk to me, Chanel. How old are you? 12, right? 12. 12. And how do you listen to this music? How do you get away with that in the house? Um, I listen to it on the Walkman. On the Walkman? On the Walkman. <laughs> how do you help little 12 year olds like this understand that the music that they're listening to should not affect their lives? We're, we're concerned about 12 year olds singing about sex like this. Yeah. So what do you say, little Well, Pam? I definitely think that Chanel is too young, but mostly I think that she listens to it for the sound and for me being a young, positive, black young woman doing what I, doing my thing, you know what I'm saying, and getting over a hump. And I want you to make sure you keep God in your life. And me, as an older person to you, I want you to, you know, be sure, you know, I feel that you're too young to be having sex. You probably, you're too young to be listening to my music, too. But if you're going to listen to it, you know, make sure you do the right thing. Don't go out and have sex for the wrong reasons. And if you do... And if you do, if you do decide one day that you want to have sex, use a condom, because I'm pretty sure you're old enough to get pregnant and catch a disease. Twelve-year-old girls listening, you can tell them all you want. Don't do it. If your mother's smoking cigarettes in front of the children, the children are going to smoke the cigarettes. Some people pointed out the need for more explicit boundaries between what is purely for adults and what's for children. There is no clean version. Play the music at a proper time when children are not listening. What about the young people? Like you say, it should be up to the music industry, the radios, you know, to not play this music. They can pick up these tapes and these CDs anywhere. They can copy them from friends, from, from older kids. You know, what about the children that don't have that guidance in their life? Somebody you know to tell them. Sex is a part of life. I'm saying, regardless whether it's music or not, kids are going to learn about sex. You know what I'm saying? It's the birds and the bees. They're going to want to know how they came. But some people they are afraid if they hear music like what Lil' Kim sings, they're going to start having sex a little too soon. Let me no. say one thing. Go on, Ed. Two things. First of all, I agree with Officer James Davidson. I always fight in Hot 97 all the time. I'm one of the leading people that fight for certain times of the day. I don't think certain songs should be played on the radio. I always fight about that, and I always fight to make sure the stuff that we play is as clean as possible. But when you start attacking hip hop, hip hop is nothing more than a reflection of the society in which we all grew up in, all right? For me, because I stay close to my community and I know what's going on. The next thing you know, you're going after Bugs Bunny, Rob. Bugs Bunny kicked, he kicked people off a cliff. Did that make little kids run out and kick people off a cliff? What about the Roadrunner? Are you going to get her first? Kim insisted that her music and persona was a manufactured image. But I have a problem when, when you talk on the interviews and articles about what you like to do orally and what you like to receive and all that. I mean, stuff like that's your personal business. You know what I'm saying? I don't think you want to air that out there. A lot of people are reading that and seeing that on TV. Kim, why don't you respond to that? I agree with you, but a lot of times um, they ask you these questions in which, you're, you know, sometimes you are subject to answer and sometimes you aren't. But at the same time, 
people we just want to hear that because of my image yeah you know what i mean half the time she stood by her lyrics the other half of the time she was playing them down an october 1998 article in spin magazine mentions that kim had pop oriented plans for her second album that wouldn't cover the same sexualized territory as her 1996 debut and another spin feature from that year titled from freaky mama to button down businesswoman kim said that stuff i rap about is what i used to do four or five years ago i've really just been chilling out lately when i hear all these things about how i'm a hoe and a slut it kind of hurts me the critics of 1996 and 97 had definitely bothered the queen bee but her follow-up albums and image were still raunchy while the backlash to kim's manufactured image inflicted further damage to her self-esteem she wasn't the only one being explicit or sexual sex is what the janet album was about this was a continuation it's still a part of my life and i'm not gonna leave that out janet jackson said when explaining her 1997 album the velvet rope which is one of my favorites of all time by the way there are a bunch of lyrics i could quote but i'll direct you to listen to rope burn first detailed a review miss jackson addresses her masturbatory dream life her enthusiasm for bondage her unwillingness to be shackled by the parameters of gender as an invitation to a threesome and her desire to cruise a club snag a stud drag him home and do him at first listen this isn't the work of the janet jackson who 11 years earlier whispered let's wait a while but actually that's exactly what it is janet's songs and image would continue to be sexy on following albums and in 2004 she was roundly punished when her breast was accidentally or purposefully exposed during the super bowl halftime show despite being blacklisted and attacked in the media for weight gain janet continued to express her sexuality in her music and performances so explicit lyrics were becoming more common not just in rap but in mainstream pop, R&B, and rock too. When Khalees was asked about using her sex appeal early in her career in 2005, she said, America is all about appealing to the eye. I have a better chance of getting where I want looking the way I do than trying to be a burlap wearing, waving incense wherever I go woman. God bless those who go that route, but it's not for me. But even the girlies who represented Afrocentrism and incense leaned into their sexy, saying the neo-soul pioneer Jill Scott on exclusively on my favorite album, this morning my man exclusively exclusively introduced me to some good extra loving. He was licking and sucking on everything just the way he should. If we widen our scope, we see more explicit representations of sexuality in all Western media, reflecting continuing trends of sexual liberation, which I've covered throughout this series. At the dawn of the 20th century, there are tons of other explicit songs from the era of 2000 to 2009, and I encourage you to tell them to me in the comments. But notice the nastiest songs are regional one-hit wonders. We're whispered on schoolyards like filthy limericks a la slob on my knob only heard on BT uncut or were never released as singles because the artists had more mainstream offerings The modern iteration of pussy rap, which is often criticized because of its current extreme mainstream popularity, formed after the early 2010s when there were pearl-clutching reactions to Nicki Minaj and Beyonce during the budding choice feminism era. Nicki Minaj surpassed the underground explicit rappers I grew up listening to like Trina and Kia, in part because she's more talented and had more varied topics, but also because of her appearance, cosigns, and her timing. Her first mixtape, 2007's Playtime Is Over, is perhaps her least set. 2008's Sucka Free had more sex appeal, but it was the freaky raps and bisexual teasing on Beam Me Up Scotty that garnered Minaj her most attention thus far. After becoming worldwide famous from her pop crossovers, her sexual lyrics and videos for songs like Anaconda garnered criticism like the kind little Kim got in the 90s. When Beyonce released Self Titled on December 13, 2013, it was groundbreaking because it was a surprise album. But many people, no doubt those who had started listening after the major success of single ladies on the tame I am Sasha Fierce or run the world from the also tame four were also shocked that self-titled was so damn freaky. Tons of blogs made lists of the raunchiest lyrics capitalizing on web chatter that one of the most respected R&B artists who just became a mom went blue. They never heard earlier freaky songs or seen Beyonce in her earlier skimpy outfits channeling Motown and Disco Diva because self-title had them in a tizzy. There was no more Sasha Fierce all her ego 
to pin her sexy side on, this was all Beyonce. On partition, now my mascara running red lipstick smudged, oh he's so horny yeah he wanna fuck, he bucked all my buttons, he ripped my blouse, he Monica lewinsky all on my gown. From that lyric, which was called out by Monica Lewinsky, to her publicizing the surfboard sex position and calling Jay-Z daddy, to criticism over Jay-Z using euphemisms featuring abusers, the album had impact. Plus, it was a video album. You could see the fantasies in her performance. Said a review, Beyonce has always seemed quite a clean cut girl next to her husband Jay-Z's protege Rihanna. But it is as if, post motherhood, Beyonce now wants to assert some adult credentials. In an interview with People Magazine, Beyonce mentioned that she tapped into her sexy after the birth of Blue Ivy and interestingly sought to be demure. I was so embarrassed after I recorded the song because I'm just talking shit. I'm like, I can't play this for my husband. I still haven't played it for my mom. She's gonna be very mad at me. Perhaps she was trying to buffer the criticism which came from predictable groups. I remember seeing tons of, but you're a mom now tweets from black Twitter. But that's not all. Said former Arkansas governor Mike Huckabee in God, Guns, Grits, and Gravy, hell of a title by the way. Beyonce was a huge breakout star before going X-rated. She proves she doesn't need to lower herself to this type of crude exploitation to be a megastar. She must know that millions of young girls look up to her as a role model to emulate, and she even has a daughter herself now. So why has she done this? And then the feminists, who are especially given the discourse because of the inclusion of We Should All Be Feminists by Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Said Tanya Steele, when I saw black feminists on Twitter just going crazy, I thought, wow, she must really have done something. I saw her in pornographic poses. I couldn't understand what black feminists were looking at. Said a white feminist, Teresa Wayman of the band Warpaint, every song on Beyonce's last album has her basically looking like a slut. And she does not need to do that. She's gorgeous and so fucking talented. And they all take it as women's liberation. Beyonce has continued to create music across a wide spectrum of topics and themes, but she has grown increasingly bold in her expressions of black female sexuality. Though she did ask Meg Thee Stallion to clean up her verse for the Savage remix in 2020. Still, Queen Bee came a long way. Back in 2002, she and Destiny's Child sang on Nasty Girl. You make it hard for women like me who try to have some integrity. You make it hard for girls like myself who respect themselves and have dignity. You're nasty, girl. You're nasty. You're trashy. Some say the song and video was Destiny's Child picking fun at their critics. Others saw it as a slut-shaming jam. In any case, it's starkly different to modern Beyonce and modern popular female music. But there continues to be an ideological rift in the interpretation of femininity and sexuality that changes with the current social norms. The added layer for black women is that we're accused of leaning into dangerous stereotypes rather than simply expressing our ourselves or embracing the world as is. Beyonce and Nicki were especially compelling in the early 2010s choice feminism era, but Nicki and Beyonce's sexual lyrics, while different in delivery from their earlier counterparts, from Lil' Kim to BWP to Bessie Smith, still continued a long tradition of not only valid expression, but of using a basic human instinct to survive in a male-dominated and capitalist world. Appealing to the human obsession with sex and recognizing that sexuality is a part of life. Of course it's Sells. If it bothers you, you know what else sells? Water, food, shelter. Despite being fundamentals to human existence, do something about those things first. Let's briefly ponder the modern world of pussy rap, which dominates the female hip hop scene. Responses to 2020's WAP, the record breaking collaboration between Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion, are emblematic of the ways that pussy rap is perceived. While all the liberal publications called the song female empowerment for openly discussing sexual expectations, conservatives complained that it would ruin America and the family. Unlike previous iterations of the pussy rap genre, sex is the central topic and image, and it's much more direct. Like broader hip hop since the 1990s, pussy rap has been seen by black conservatives as a degenerate form of culture, intentionally spread by the music industry to destroy the black family. For spiritual black people who are apolitical but socially conservative, it is low vibrational trash that not only encourages discussion about soul ties, but seeks to destroy the black family. But Criticism of explicit female rappers is coded with something extra that the black men don't have to worry about. Numerous male rappers who rap endlessly about their ops, broke boys, designer labels, pussy, and violence have complained about the brazen sexuality of today's femcs who make their names and livings from finding different ways to brag about their sex games, in addition to rapping about other aspects of black womanhood. Remember that study of blues singers earlier? They rarely sang about children, domestic life, husband, marriage, or news. This 
isn't new. However, the women today pinning their own freaky lyrics is. At the heart of criticism flung towards black women are the expectations that we will one day be mothers or someone's wife, bearers of the next generation of black children, and that taints people's perceptions of our occupations, sexual appetites, and more. The explicit lyrics of today are both expressions of normal human desire and also for some, a defense mechanism. Sociologist and feminist Beverly Skeggs argued in a 1993 essay using bitches with problems as a focus that because black men in hip hop both feared the power of women, citing the Ice Cube quote, and sought to subordinate them, assertive and ultra sexual rap music was fighting back. It took the battery pack out of slut shaming and good girl, bad girl binaries. So it's not surprising that freaky lyrics, beginning with the wider mainstream success of Lil' Kim and Nicki, to the ones that veer to the shocking and humorous like the songs of Cupcake or the newly controversial Sexy Red, have an audience. But for each female artist, unlike the male artists who talk endlessly about the same things, the public begs them to diversify or risk being called a one-trick pony. In the case of Cupcake, she seemingly disavowed her explicit music and retired before coming back with a less overtly sexual focus. She's not the only one who has debuted to massive criticism with sexual music and then toned down or diversified. But do female rappers have to diversify their lyrics? If Currency gets to rap about cars and weed and money for over two decades, shout out to Jet Life and Spit It is, is not an insult, why can't the girls? What if they just wanna make fun music? As for my own enjoyment of pussy rap, I don't wanna dance in a club to the same five twerk songs, so it's good to have variety. And not everything is for everybody. If a woman can make 50 great songs about sex for my playlist and none about the Louisiana Purchase, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, or American Imperialism, who am I to stop her? I also read, so I don't need all of my rap music to contain world events, society ills, or lessons. Plus, many of these pussy rappers have more personal cuts and non-sexual topics on their albums. Y'all just don't look for them. But I do not find sexual lyrics or personas to be inherently empowering, nor do I see them challenging the ongoing problem of misogyny in hip hop or the black community. Choosing to wear your sexuality out loud in a world that often punishes women for it is brave and also lucrative, but it's not exactly empowering. And this is how I feel about sex work in general. Plenty of pussy rappers and sex workers and women are problematic. We all are. But when there is massive backlash to songs like WAP by conservatives who turn sexually active adults into villains, they effectively force defense of the artist and turn it into a worthless argument about whether or not it is empowering, when it's usually just sexy and fun. In today's world, sexiness can be subversive, it can be empowering, but it often simply just is. Pussy rap is a lucrative genre, one of many, but when you consider the ways in which sexual female rappers have not been protected or have been harmed, it can often serve as a harsh reminder too. When Megan Thee Stallion turned against the traditional expectation of black women in rap to protect black men, her sexual capital did not save her. In fact, black men who were already threatened by her sexuality rushed to defend the man who shot her and made endless excuses. If a woman thinks being sexually attractive in the perfect sexual fantasy will protect them from violence, they are as mistaken as pick me's who think that being walked all over by men and wearing modest clothing all the time will keep them protected. The majority of female rappers who quietly distance themselves from Meg or publicly affirm Tory Lanez would similarly be discarded or attacked by misogynists if they use their platforms to be publicly critical of violence perpetuated by a man in hip hop. Think about Sexy Red, who had an awkward interview with Little Yachty detailing her experience being raped. Can you tell us like the craziest thing that's ever happened to you? Mm. Crazy shit. It's gonna stay between us. I got raped before. That's the craziest thing that ever happened to me. Maybe something a little under that. <laughs> okay, yeah, but maybe mm -hmm. something. Okay, I mean, I don't know. Like, 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 maybe something. Shoot out. Like, there we go. Shoot out, there you know. Yeah, that, yes, that's yes, more yes. what we were thinking. Really. Yeah. She was just posted up with Kodak Black, the rapist, shortly after a viral and naive tweet mentioned how the rap guys in the industry love her. If she ever experienced violence by one of these men and talked about it or discussed their abusive histories, she would quickly lose her status as the cool hood chick with explicit lyrics. This is no different than in the real world amongst non-famous black people too. Just look at the femicide rates and the commentary made about women who who are sex workers or women who say no to a man. Take it from a black woman who is highly publicly sexual. It's natural, it's lucrative, it sells. But you are given a currency that comes coated with something worse than rape allegations, abuse allegations, or even murder convictions. The sticky sludge of misogynoir. 
the day, explicit lyrics have always been a thing and you should let black women live. There are plenty of black women to choose from in entertainment, ones who do and don't represent your values because we aren't a monolith and never have been. On a grander scale, we have real problems. Regardless of our sexual habits and preferences or of our marital status or occupation, stop killing us. Pay us what we deserve. Let us be in control of our reproductive systems. If you can't do any of that shit, support the art you enjoy and stop promoting things you don't. But I will add that I have more to say about the impact of female rappers on black women in dating. But that's another topic for another day. Also, there needs to be a clear line between adult entertainment and mainstream artists. Parents can help facilitate this by not giving unchecked internet and pop culture access to their children. Explicit lyrics and also pornography cannot be substitutes for thorough sexual educations about consent, boundaries, STD prevention, and other responsibilities. That's right, entertainment should not be raising your children and sexual education needs to be a priority. That's like a recurring theme and let's talk about sex history. That's it for this video. I can't wait to discuss a bunch of parallel topics in Lectual Does the 90s. Thanks for watching and I hope you like and subscribe. Get sources over on Patreon and be sure to tell me your favorite explicit or sexy artists in the comments.